Um, so today, uh, I, I'm going to kind of briefly set the baseline um, and provide some background so we're all on the same page um, in, in, um, about, this, about the discussion here today. But then I'm going to get out the way and turn it over, uh, ask some questions to this great panel who's with us today, and then hopefully we'll open it up to you guys um, so we can get a, a lively discussion going for 8.30 a.m. in the morning. Um, <laughs> so um, one of the things that I wanted to do and kind of just set the baseline is when I first kind of started to engage with this stuff, one of the questions that, that I had is, is we, we all talk about, you know, social media. I mean, it's a, it's a hot word, hot phrase these days. And I think intuitively we, we all kind of know what it means, and, but I think we have a tendency to describe it um, more so not in necessarily kind of explicit terms about what it does and what it allows us to do, but more so on the tools that we're familiar with. So, you know, you ask somebody, well, what is social media? Oh, that, you know, that's Facebook, that's Twitter, that's, you know, YouTube, what have you. Um, but I don't know that that necessarily gets at the core of what it is about those tools that are unique and that um, help us, and that has generated so much excitement within the community. Um, um, and so one of the things I want to do is kind of look and see, well, what, what, what is social media exactly? And in doing kind of some, some searches on this, there's still not, I, I guess, kind of a consensus definition. There's, there's, there's some things out there. And this is kind of what I came up with, pulling from several sources, um, I think there's a good book out there uh, called Cognitive Surplus by Clay Shirky, um, and he he delves into kind of some of some of these underlying principles in the of, of new media, and what is it that's unique about um, from from previous iterations, um, and then some other other things that I've borrowed here and there. Um, this is not I, I would not claim this to be an airtight definition of social media, but I think it works for kind of setting the baseline of what we're interested in, and so. We would define it as, or I define it as, technology that enable mass collaboration and can be used to monitor, disseminate, and exchange information in ways that are both accessible. And, and by accessible, we mean, um, and, and I kind of use this to distinguish from kind of maybe traditional communication tools or, or things like email, um, where we talk about, um, you know, an email, if I send that to one person, I can certainly send that to a group of people, right? But in order to find out the contents of what's on that email chain, somebody else has to add me to that group. The distinction here we're talking about is that this information is kind of, it's, it's out there, right? If you're interested in a particular topic, um, you can go out and you can find it. Um, and certainly, you know, Facebook got in a lot of trouble for, you know, not providing enough privacy, uh, privacy settings to restrict the flow of information coming from my account. But in a general sense, these are tools that allow people to access the information freely and openly as opposed to some type of walled garden that I'd have to go through. And then the kind of second piece of this <clears throat> is a permanence factor to it. And the distinction there is where we talk about, again, other traditional media forms, uh, TV, radio, a telephone conversation. Sure, those may be great to get out messages uh, to a large group of people. Um, but unless you know you are, are video purposely videotaping a, a TV show or you know transcribed a radio broadcast, that message is kind of lost, um, you know, to the ether, so to speak. And so, kind of the distinction here is that we that social media is a blend of both the accessible component and the permanence component. Um, so I, I, I'd definitely be interested to hear how people feel about this later on, but I, I think I, I definitely think so, think it works. And so when we move from kind of the underlying aspect of what is social media, then the second question is, well, well, how do people use use social media, and what are its uses? Um, and so, <clears throat> again, kind of from the camp, we had uh, several kind of moderated sessions, and we tried to provide a variety of venues for well for people who were trying to learn more about. Um, social media and several new technologies and just very baseline, how do I begin to use these things, what are they about, all the way up to people who are interested in, you know, I'm there, I'm a believer, I get it, but then what are the next steps within my organization to push this forward? And so one of the beginning sessions, we had several um, participants, one of the participants asked the moderators if they, could, if they could categorize the uses of social media along four dimensions, how would you do it? Um, and the, the moderators categorize it um, along these dimensions, which I, which I think are, are, provide us a pretty good framework for how we think about kind of progression and use in, in, bo in both the resources committed to use um, and the level of engagement from a, from a personal standpoint, right? And so you could start out on the far, far left here with just an awareness and listening, right? If I have an interest in what's going on on Twitter, I don't even have to have a Twitter account. I can go look at a conversation across a particular hashtag. Um, but then we move a little bit more to one-way communications where, you know, there may be an organization 
who wants to push out information, right? And I, I think actually the DC uh, fire and EMS service is, is a good example of this. I don't see, I, I follow them on Twitter and they're constantly pushing out information. There's not much conversation going on, um, but you know, if you just kind of want a, a constant awareness of, of what things are happening, that's a, that's a place to go. But then we move a little bit further to, you know, maybe I could start as an emergency manager or just, you know, as, as a volunteer who's interested in these issues, having a conversation with my constituents or, or people who kind of want to know information and want something from me. Um, and I think a, a classic example of this and one that came up a lot during, during the camp session was um, the use of these tools by uh, Mayor Cory Booker in Newark, New Jersey um, during the snowstorms this past December, I believe it was. And I don't know if you f followed his, how many people actually, uh, A, used Twitter, but followed his Twitter account uh, when you were on there, is, and I think it was, it was partly the difference between how his response to the snowstorms was perceived versus, uh, I think, Mayor Bloomberg in New York, is, is Cory Booker was very active on these. You know, people were sending him requests. He was responding, retweeting, saying, you know, I'll be there in a minute, and then actually showing up, taking a picture, you know, shove, of him shoveling the, the driveway. Uh, and then so th we get into this kind of two-way communication, and I think the other thing he did kind of pushing us out a little further is leveraging the community as a resource. It wasn't just, hey, I'm going to be Superman and try to come shovel everyone's driveway, but start to try to encourage the community and use the community as a resource to help each other out, right? And so if you're on these, these mediums and you're engaged and you've built up a community, when, it be, when it's time for, uh, you know, a large-scale response or even something smaller, you have that community to lean on, right? And so this, these are kind of the, the framework that, you know, was, was offered up at the camp, but I think is a useful kind of way to begin to start thinking about these things. Um, and so on the back end of talking about the tools, the other piece of this is, you know, how we as a society are changing, um, not just in, you know, hey, you know, I have a Facebook page now, but it's, it's, a, it's more of a fundamental way in the way that we're getting information these days, we're sharing information, the way we're interacting with each other. Um, I know that I, since I've been in D.C., I have several people, friends who are now kind of, so to speak, real life friends who I met initially via Twitter or some other platform out there um, in which we, you know, started a conversation around a particular interest that we shared in common. Um, and so the way is, like these numbers up here, you know, 65%, 13%, all of these numbers you can go, you know, a, a year ago they were all lower, a year from now they will all be higher, right? And so maybe at some point we'll, we'll hit the bound, uh, you know, 100%, um, but they're not, I can, I can be, be pretty sure in saying this, these numbers aren't going backwards, right? So society as a change and how we engage with, with each other in, in information, it's changing, right? So how do our institutions change, right? We've seen, you know, the effects that this has had on, on uh, kind of democratic uh, revolutions in the Middle East. Um, we've seen the, the news industry in particular deal and grapple with, you know, people are now getting information from many different sources, how do we change and adapt to this, right? And I don't think it's any different for the emergency management community. I think there's either a choice of we can stick to what we've done traditionally and what we're comfortable with or start to get out ahead of this. And I think uh, uh, Deputy Administrator Serena actually said it pretty well at the, um, at, the, at the camp this past March, you know, either we get out ahead of this um, and we're kind of seen as leaders or and, and very relevant, or we stay behind, and then we're going to look up in you know a year or two years from now and, and wonder what just happened, and, and kind of be pushed to the side is, is not entirely irrelevant, but but less and less so. Um, so, kind of one of the things that we have to deal with, and I think is, uh, individuals who kind of who are champions of this technology and its use in emergency management is is they have to answer this question of, A, well, why, why do we care about this, but also, you know, why should you or why should I care about this, right? Um, and I think, you know, it's not enough to just say, especially when we're advocating and talking about millions of dollars being invested in kind of underlying technology infrastructure, right? Research, university research programs are being built around this stuff. And there's a whole host of new interested players and actors in this area. It's not enough to say, oh, well, this is just the next cutting edge thing. Well, everybody knows social media is, is, is it's, it's on its way. Um, it's not enough to just, to just be kind of flashy and new. There has to be some substance beneath uh, what we're talking about. And so kind of dealing with this question, I think in emergency management, it all comes back to 
how can these tools, these technologies, be used to save lives, right? If you can't prove to me at the end of the day that it makes any difference in, you know, how we're better able to respond to disasters and hopefully, you know, increase life saves across the board, then I can't earnestly sit up here and say that we should be making these investments or should be even spending time having this conversation today. Um, and I particularly love this. This was a quote from uh, Brian Humphreys. Who's a, he, was, he wasn't at the camp, uh, but he's, he's a public information officer at uh, Los Angeles Fire Department and kind of one of the, the leaders within kind of pushing for the adoption and engagement of these tools. Um, and, you know, I think kind of that quote right there, I think that gets to the heart of it, right? It, over 120 years, it holds more potential to save lives than any other civic tool. Um, and so, but, but how, does it, how does it hold potential to save lives? And I think when we get and we start talking about emergency management, in particular in the U.S., it, most things are, are centered around, you know, what type of information are we getting and how quickly are we getting that information, right? So in the first, you know, we often talk, talk about the first 72 hours are critical after a disaster response, right? And so it, it almost kind of befuddles me when I, when I talk to people who are in this community who, you know, kind of quickly dismiss the value or the use of, of social media when it's fundamentally a community that's built around information, right? What information do we have? How quickly are we able to make sense of this information? How are we sharing this information? I mean, nine times out of ten, if something goes wrong within a disaster, um, usually you'll read the after action report and, you know, it was coordination, it wasn't information sharing, wasn't where it should have been, right? And so a community that's kind of bound up into information being that linchpin into how well uh, we do something, I think, you know, it's, it's almost, it's, it's a little strange to me that you wouldn't want to be engaged with, uh, with, a, with a medium that provides so much information, right? Um, this, this graphic here, so Twitter likes to think, or, or starts, likes to think about particular events, and they use this metric of uh, tweets per second for a particular event, right? And so on an average, on an average day, there's about 1,300, you could calculate 1,300 tweets per second, um, across the board. And then we see here sometimes you have maybe not so relevant events as Beyonce at the MTV Awards, but around events such as the Virginia earthquake um, this year, completely unexpected, um, earthquake and tsunami in Japan, you see these spikes in information, right? And so we've gone from around 1,300 tweets um, per second to 5,000 tweets per second coming some coming out of that area, but just the conversation that's being had around this, right? People are focused, this is clearly, people are focused on this, having a conversation, engaged, right? And so I think one of the challenges there is, and the question that we have to answer is, how much of that information is actually useful, right? But and one thing that, you know, you kind of it was talking to me about this, we were having this conversation uh, the other day, is even if you consider, right, so let's, let's take that number down for 5,000 tweets per second for an event like the Virginia earthquake or Japan earthquake, right? 4,000 tweets per second gets you to around 345 million tweets per day in that first 24-hour period, right? Now, let's assume that 99.9% .9 of those are completely irrelevant or kind of redundant or just have nothing to do with what uh, we in the emergency management community are concerned about or will be concerned about in disaster response. Even if you take, you know, that only 0.1% of these are useful, you end up with almost 345,000 data points about that event, right? Those are 345,000, you know, people either have resource needs, there, there are reports about uh, damaged infrastructure, um, there's people looking and missing for loved ones. Um, and so there's all these types of things that we, we care about and there's this information out there, right? And so certainly there's not, it's not easy to, to narrow down to these 345,000, but that's the issue there. Either you believe that there's some information out there that, uh, that's worth trying, to, worth trying to, to, to dig out of there, or you don't. And I guess, <laughs> We up here kind of believe that, there, that there is, there's, there's value to this, um, and what we hope to do is drive the conversation. If you're not there yet, I mean, be up front, we're up front about in this, this document, uh, and I hope you guys will all read it, it's very upfront about the challenges um, that are there, but I think we've started to see enough kind of anecdotal success stories to at least raise awareness and, and want to think a little bit more about how do we engage with these things. I'm sorry, can I ask a question about that very provocative? Sure. Right. 
I agree. So, <laughs> I agree. Do you have any further comments on, on sort of that disparity? Because, I mean, those two look like the same, from a tweet perspective, the same density of damage potential. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I guess I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it obviously it was not the same damage. Um, the tweets per second, I mean, I think there's a whole host of factors that we need to take into account when kind of contextualizing these numbers. A, there's just a lot more Twitter users in the United States and a lot more people in this region who are affected by it. Um, but even, even with that, there were still a ton of people in the United States tweeting about the Japan earthquake, right? Um, <clears throat> So I think kind of in one of the things at the camp, right, is how do you, and I think Pascal, Pascal would be really great to talk about this in a little bit, um, is how do you sort through all of that, you know, to get the situational awareness or to find that information? And so, and, and you know, we talk about this in the paper. I mean, there are still, I think there are great tools um, that people are developing out there in an open source way. I know uh, Yu Shahidi um, has developed, it's called a Swift River Platform, and it's kind of designed to try to basically uh, filter out a lot of the useless information um, real time and hopefully get us to some of that some of, some of the important stuff and I think you know each disaster is going to be there's going to be certain characteristics we'll say well maybe we can you know we need 50 percent of this information and not just 0.1 percent but I think moving forward we need to start developing kind of those rules of thumbs and those and guidelines for how we engage with each with each disaster I, I want to get through the presentation and then we can uh, certainly have more of a conversation, I guess. Um, so I just want to briefly background folks on, <clears throat> on again. So this report was, again, kind of, it came out of the uh, SMEM camp, which happened this past March. Um, and I believe, and Kim can correct me if I'm wrong, the anniversary of the SMEM community is, is, is today, or is tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Okay. And you'll actually see uh, some blog posts um, around that anniversary, but also a great group of uh, bloggers um, we'll be, we'll have some special posts tomorrow on uh, particular findings in the report and their views on, on things that have come out. Um, but so, kind of briefly, the uh, social media emergency management community, I guess it was founded, for lack of a better word, uh, last, last year. Um, and if you go on at pretty much any time of the day uh, and you type it, you go on to Twitter and you type in this hash SMEM, there's a conversation and there's a group of folks who are talking about these issues and the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, and so it's really, what it is, it's, a, it's kind of a virtual community of emergency managers and uh, kind of affiliated folks who are engaging and trying to answer a lot of the challenges that we've been dealing with. And so this camp, um, I believe, was the, the community kind of formed online, again, in kind of uh, true to form with, with regard to social media. It's not, it's not exclusive. Anybody in here can go jump on and contribute to the conversation at any time of the day. Um, but this camp was the first time that a lot of these individuals had, and, I, and it was unbeknownst to me beforehand, was a lot of these times these individuals, was the first time a lot of these individuals had met in person, right? But you would think going in, kind of the familiarity with one another, that they had known each other for, for, for years, you know? Um, and so that, that was kind of cool for me to see. Um, and so the camp structure, and I don't know how many people are familiar with the camp or, uh, or what's called an unconference, is we had this event, but there was no kind of set agenda ahead of time, right? And so what we wanted to do is basically source uh, topics from the participants early that morning um, and then formulate breakout, se breakout sessions um, around those topics. And so early in the morning, we had a session where we asked people to go out to the, to the board here um, and post topics. Um, post issues under kind of these larger topic areas. And, and so we got, we, we had a topic area for policy, a getting started, a situational awareness, a community building, and several open sessions. And so people went out there, they took these sticky notes, they wrote on the board and said, hey, I'm interested in this, I'm interested in that. And then we had a group of folks who went through the process uh, real time of uh, placing these sticky notes together and formulating tracks under each of these sessions, right? And so this, this, those discussions for the rest of the day formed uh, the primary data input, so to speak, for, for this report, right? And so ostensibly, I mean, there's certainly some of uh, our views represent, represented in this report based on kind of the findings that we saw, but largely um, a lot of the structure and the main topic areas that bubbled out were issues that were discussed 
um, that day. And so we wanted to kind of record those and give a larger voice to them. Um, so also during that day, there was uh, this SMEM11 hashtag. We had this going just as, as we do today, and we were archiving those tweets that came out. So there was a, com a back channel conversation going on. And, and what we did is um, basically use those inputs along with uh, the documents from that day, pre- and post-event surveys to, to feed into the report. This right here, uh, nobody can see it. Uh, I have it posted online someplace. But this is a mapping of the conversation from, uh, from Twitter on that day. Um, which I thought was kind of a cool visualization. So you can kind of see uh, down here that FEMA was, was mentioned quite a bit and was, you know, was pretty central to the conversation on that day. And you can see kind of other folks who were kind of driving and active participants uh, with, within the community. And so um, taking those, taking the, uh, the, those outputs from, from the camp, what we tried to do in the paper is, is frame what we were talking about in the context of a larger transformation of what we've termed uh, the domestic response enterprise. Um, we'll hear terms today like whole community, um, where we talk about not just the government, um, you know, contributing to these issues or contributing to response efforts, but this, this whole community approach where you have the NGOs, nonprofit organizations, private sector, and individual citizens who are actively kind of helping to converge and, and, and provide response within, within these events. And so, <clears throat> What, we, what we're talking about, what we were really talking about at this camp is a transformation of, of this enterprise, right? And so <clears throat> going into this kind of these group of actors are, are several inputs, right? And so we have kind of a national, uh, national response structure. And so there's several kind of ways in which the domestic question of emergency response is unique to, say, an international response setting or even response within another country, right? We have certain rules, laws, governance structures um, that guide how we practice uh, domestic re or emergency response within the U.S. And I think that's kind of, that's really one of the things, too, that we wanted to focus on in this paper is because we had a unique opportunity to hear from to my knowledge, kind of one of the largest collections of U.S. emergency managers talking, sitting in one place and talking about these issues. Um, I think Haiti was kind of the big impetus in, that drove a lot of this discussion about social media inputs into disaster response. Um, and you hear a lot on the international piece, but I think there are unique challenges that we need to deal with if we're going to talk about how do we integrate these things within a domestic structure. And so that's really kind of one of the things that we wanted to do with this report. And so it, those inputs go into this community and ostensibly we hope that how those structures, how those resources play in when mingled with, you know, when, when fused together with the actors in the community and, and folks working together ultimately result in lives saved, right? And so we've had this kind of traditional up until, say, the last five or six years, one way in which emergency management has been practiced um, with several kind of smaller innovations within that, but it's essentially been kind of the same thing. And then now we have, you know, uh, kind of this new, the new influx of new technologies and data streams that are flowing into the community and, and can be used, whether or not we choose to use them um, at this point is, is, a, is a kind of more of an organizational question. Um, but the opportunities that these new technologies, open source and publicly available data, and the, the willingness to leverage and use uh, new online digital volunteers, um, we can potentially see how we can increase this live save number, or the, the potential or the value there um, to do so. And that's really the question is, given these new technologies input into this, how can we create and capture that value with respect to increasing the number of lives saved? Um, whether that's through preparedness, whether it's through response, um, recovery, et cetera. Um, and so kind of taking these, the camp was specifically around these, the new technology, the social media inputs, and then coming out of that camp were, well, what, what, what other inputs are around that that we need to be cognizant of, because these things work together, that will help us or allow us to achieve that potential value, right? And so these six areas here were what we, and you'll see within the report, are kind of the structures of the way that we chose to talk about the issues that came out of the camp. And so these were kind of the, based on the participants' discussion, the things that they saw as challenges kind of moving forward. Um, and so resources, laws, policy, and guidance, uh, community building, um, buying and adoption, 
and this really gets to a leadership question of, you know, how do you create that, that feeling of, of leadership uh, buy-in within your organization, reliability, reliability verification, and instruction integration. Um, just kind of real quick, just a, a highlight of, of how we talk about two of those issues within the paper, and then I'll wrap up and we can get to the, uh, to the questions. One of the ones that came up, and we see this time and time again within emergency response is trust being an underlying factor in you know, how we engage with one another, particularly in a heightened time of need or of crisis. And so one of the, the big topics of conversation was there was how do you build community and how do you engage with one another. Um, and I have the, these two examples up here, which I'll try to run over real quick, but I thought these were, were kind of interesting examples in why it, in why it it, there's some value in investing in building the community and what you can actually get accomplished um, through these mediums. Um, so one of the examples was the New York Times. I don't know if you all remember earlier this year, there was a whole trove of Sarah Palin emails that came out, and folks were really interested in what were, what were in these things. And so the New York Times said, oh, we'll have a great idea. We're going to crowdsource or you know, put these out to the community and say, hey, can you guys help us go through these emails? And they actually received a huge backlash because you know, people saying, well, no, we don't get paid to do this. We're not going to do your job, right? And so this, you know, people kind of cite this as a failure in trying to, in, in community building, because they hadn't set the expectations ahead of time uh, or engaged with the community to be able to have the currency or the trust, so to speak, to go and, and make that request. Um, I think kind of an example on the opposite end of that spectrum is um, Andy Carvin, who's a reporter uh, with, the, uh, with NPR. And he's kind of revolutionized, in some sense, the way in which journalists cover world events. Um, and he's, you know, he sources a lot of his information through Twitter. And earlier this year, there was an um, issue with a blogger that they termed gay girl in Damascus. And it was thought to be this lesbian woman blogger in Damascus who had, who had turned up missing. And folks were concerned about what had happened with her. Um, and so Carvin, who's very engaged and very responsive, if you ever talk to him on Twitter, um, very engaged with his community, and it, something didn't kind of seem right to him. And so he started pushing out to his community and making requests and trying to filter down and find out, well, what was going on with this woman? Where was she at? And I think it turned out, kind of getting information back from his community, it turned out that it wasn't actually not a lesbian woman in Damascus, but an like a, a older white male in Scotland or something like that. I don't remember exactly. <laughs> but just, I, I just provide those two examples as, as to why kind of uh, one, one of the issues that we talk about in the paper and why it's so important to kind of engage, engage with these things in that type of way. Um, and then kind of a more kind of central to U.S. Uh, domestic response structure is um, incident command system. And how do we begin to, we have these structures within our organization, um, within our organizations and nationally in ways that we have traditionally approached disasters and approached incident ma management. And so where do these new technologies, the new digital volunteers, um, these new kind of nonprofit organizations that are popping up, where do they integrate into that structure, right? And so these are one of the kind of a larger question of, you know, what type of role should people have within the organization? And where should, if we're going to use this information and use this technology, where do we want to put these things at? Um, so those are just two of the examples to kind of seed the conversation a little bit. Uh, we make recommendations, final recommendations in the report. One is um, to begin to define the response enterprise um, uh, a bit more carefully. And, and one of the first questions I I'm going to ask is about whole community. And, and we've kind of heard that refrain from, from FEMA over the past two or three years and how we approach emergency management. Um, and I think we're starting to finally get, I, I think there's a report coming out this month, but we're starting to finally get a little bit more meat on the bones on what, what exactly do we have in mind or what exactly are we talking about when we say whole of community? Who are the actors? What are the structures and guidance? And, you know, is it something that we're just going to speak to or is it something that we're actually going to put funding behind structures in place and actually encourage people to engage with? Um, another one is baseline establishment um, and understanding kind of what is, what is the technology, technology capacity in our emergency operations centers or in our organizations across the country? Are people engaging with these things? Do they have the tools or the, to, to engage with these things? Um, we'll talk a little bit more, and I'll get to these, about messaging value, what are some of the operational benefits, how these things integrate with exercise and real-world events. Um, one of the central issues has been that I've seen is reliability and usefulness of this information, and I think that gets to the gentleman's question earlier. And then lastly, uh, training and education. Um, I don't know if I went over my time, but now I'm going to open it up to the, to the panel. Um, how are we doing on time? 9-11. Okay. Weird. <laughs> <laughs>
Can I ask? Can I ask? Is that a comment or the time? Gentlemen, <laughs> your, your question about, you were talking about looking at the difference of numbers. I, I want to get in there real quick and just say, does it really matter what kind of numbers we're getting right now? Because we're getting better numbers than we've ever gotten before. So if you look at King County, where I'm from in Seattle, I have 2 million people in my county. If I get 1% of that, that's 20,000 people in a second telling me what's going on, and I get, let's say that 99% is failure of you know retweets, garbage, whatever, um, and I get that 1% of that, that's still more than most likely the officers that I have in the region online, going through a call center, going through a radio, because I have this beautiful, nice radio that works, but only one person can talk to it on a channel at a time, whereas I can get that many more in a second. So to me, I look at it as a responder, I don't care the numbers right now in that process. I'm getting more than what I'm normally getting in a, in a first place. So I'm looking at that as an opportunity for me to expand my situational awareness and capability. Because if I can get three types of information out of that one second, one, there's no more water at a logistics station for someone to get water, I can help move that process faster. Another, I can get information on where I need to send medical resource teams to a lot faster. And third, I know how much for this is a disaster gonna be, so if I need to call in federal assistance, I can get them rolling faster because we know that it takes time. And they're doing much better at that, but no one's ready in the federal government to respond like a fire team or a police officer in the field. So those types, those three basic information to me, much better. So the numbers are not necessarily as concerning. What I'm so. trying to think about is systematically to analyze these data streams so as to maximize Cor what you're going to Exactly. Get out Correct. And so, for instance, I would have liked to <coughs> So just, just cut that by a baseline uh, of what the daily tweet averages in the, in the two different areas would be to, to get a sense of how much, my language, signal to noise is showing up. And then how do you sift and sort within that? I mean, yeah. So one so of it, it's trying to dig one layer deeper to, to more systematically rather than anecdotally pull out the good stuff. And I appreciate that because I'm, I'm that same way, but here's the challenge that I've been facing. I mean, like, I, I have a laptop, I'm streaming, I'm, I'm moving forward and faster, government doesn't. And right now, the, my problem is, is I need to just get them using the tool and then moving forward to that next step. If I go all the way too fast like that, they, it, it shuts down a little bit, and that's part of the challenge. So if I, I could to comment on something. Um, I think we're kind of in a twilight zone in a way. Um, when Facebook and Twitter and all these social media tools were developed, technology always has unintended consequences. I don't think the people who developed those tools ever envisioned them being used in a crisis like we're using them today. As I look into the future, I see those analytical tools available where you can sift and sort the data in real time and have a report every 30 minutes or 10 minutes, however often you want, on what the community is saying, what is critical, what is noise, et cetera. Those tools are available now, but they're quite expensive. And so what Pascal is saying is that he's in this middle twilight zone. He knows the tools exist. He knows the future of the tools. He knows how to use the tools. But our ability to sift and sort that data is limited. And that's where the volunteer technological community comes in. They help us sift and sort that data as well. But we don't really know those folks, except for Chris, who we know very well. <laughs> um, so. It's the community who's learning the tools, getting to the next step is a challenge because they're, they're still at step one. Oh, what's Twitter? <laughs> so we have a vast, diff, you know, a, a vast community of users here. Some are here and some are still learning what a hashtag is. So, and so I, I agree with if, you. If you guys, guys or, and I think you're exactly right. The tools are available to do that. They're just expensive. So if we could back up for one minute, one moment, I'd, I'd first like to introduce the panel. Um, <laughs> We're so ready to go. First, the first voice you heard was the uh, was the voice of Pascal Schubach, who is a full-time emergency management uh, program manager at the King County Office of Emergency Management in Seattle, uh, Washington. And he is also a member of, one of the core team members of Crisis Commons, um, and he'll talk a little bit more about that, and one of kind of the leading innovators within the space of SMEM. Uh, the second voice you heard was Kim Stevens. Um, and I don't know if you all have read her blog, but it's a very great source of information uh, with respect to these issues. So she is the author of the I Disaster 2.0 blog. If you haven't checked it out, please check it out. Uh, and uh, 
She's also now at ABT Associates. App Associates. Yeah, App Associates. Okay. Um, to my left, immediate left, is uh, Wendy Harmon. She is the Director of Social Strategy for the American Red Cross. Um, Wendy directs social strategy and engagement at the Red Cross, empowering stakeholders to fulfill the Red Cross mission on the social web. In this role, since its inception in 2006, she is responsible for the national social media presence, as well as listening, engaging, and acting on 3,000 plus social mentions each day. Um, to her left is Rachel Rackison, and she is the Director of Public Affairs for FEMA. She came to FEMA in May 2010 from the House of Education and Labor Committees. Um, in her current role she, at FEMA, she oversees the agency's national press office and strategy, including all external and internal communications. Um, and then at the end, um, let me get the other two, is Karen, Dr. Karen Smilowitz. Um, she is an associate professor in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences at Northwestern University and holds a joint appointment with the Northwestern Transportation Center. Um, Dr. Smilowitz also holds the Junior William A. Patterson Chair in Transportation. And she's here today because she's currently leading the Northwestern Initiative on humanitarian logistics uh, with fellow IMES faculty member Irina Dolinskaya. Um, and so I think we've assembled a really good panel here today, and I see the conversation is already going, uh, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is great. Um, and so I just I, I want to kind of toss out a few questions for the, to get the panel started, um, and then we'll definitely open it up more to um, the audience questions, because your questions are probably a little bit more interesting than mine anyways. Uh, so one of the first things I wanted to talk about, and we talk about kind of a unique, well, why, why are we focusing on kind of U.S. emergency response, and why can't we still just, what, what value in there is there in talking about it from that perspective as opposed to kind of the international conversation that a lot of folks have been having? And one of the things that has really uh, interested me, and I want to get you guys' take on, is, is this notion of whole community, right? And and it's become more and more something that we've been hearing under uh, Administrator Fugate's time at, at FEMA, and we've seen it now start to, this particular language, creep into our national doctrine, uh, doctrine as far as how we respond to disasters. And so earlier this year, uh, President Obama issued a PPD-8, which is a presidential policy directive, and which called for the creation of a new national preparedness goal and national preparedness system. And so he starts out, our national preparedness is a shared responsibility of all levels of government, the private and nonprofit sectors, and individual citizens. Um, so what I'm really curious is, taking a step back from the, the, the technology and social media piece is, what does this, that particular statement, what does whole community, what does that mean to folks on the panel? Is this something, have we always done this and we're just an increased emphasis or is this really a new way to think about uh, emergency management? Um, maybe we'll start with Rachel as the FEMA yeah, can representative. I was going to say, if I don't mind jumping in here, um, I guess first just starting out, does everyone here know what whole community means? Have you heard it before? Does this sound like Latin to you? I would just be curious to sort of see a show of hands just because I want to, okay, so a good group of folks have, so some haven't. Um, to sort of take a step back, as Clarence said, essentially what whole community means in the way that Administrator Fugate um, sort of envisions it, and certainly in the way that he's tried to uh, sort of apply this philosophy to the way that we do business, at, not just at FEMA, but really within the larger emergency management community, is it's a recognition that certainly the government alone can never be sort of the only member of the team. And if we rely on the government alone to sort of do the job whether it's as emergency managers or, or quite frankly, in, a, in just any other sort of facet of at least our mission at FEMA, um, we're going to fail. So it's, it's both a recognition that we need to sort of take all of the needs of the entire community into account when we're doing our disaster planning, uh, preparation, response, uh, recovery efforts, mitigation efforts. Um, so that means not just sort of thinking about um, folks like you or I who are sort of very able-bodied and maybe can take care of ourselves, but thinking about the needs of young children, thinking about the needs of the elderly, thinking about the needs of uh, folks with disabilities, all the different members of the community who just, at least in the world of em emergency management, really haven't traditionally sort of been planned for or appropriately thought of as part of the bigger equation in the past. Um, so it's both thinking about all the different needs and how we're going to meet them, and then also thinking about leveraging the entire community to meet those needs. Um, so it's sort of that, that two-pronged um, just sort of strategy or approach, I guess I would say. But I know that it's, it's a, an approach that Administrator Fugate is actually the first to admit. It's just a philosophy that he's actually talked about for years, but we know that sort of in government, people often like to sort of coin a new acronym or term or phrase. So whole community is sort of the, the term that has come to being. 
um, that really sort of encompasses that. And I think it actually does a pretty good job of, of describing it. But that said, I know a lot of people sometimes, at least in my world, sort of dealing a lot with reporters, they'll hear the term whole community and people sort of look at you blankly like, what are you actually talking about? So I think it's always helpful to just sort of explain sort of the, the concept behind it. Um, and obviously it does wind up sort of, you know, having a lot of, um, I would just sort of say shared uh, principles with the way that we're using um, social media and new technologies to sort of better do our jobs. It's certainly a big part of that. Um, and I think partly because it really empowers the rest of the community, whether it's the public, whether it's private sector organizations, volunteer groups, the faith-based community, um, to really be a part of um, the team and to really help us do our jobs better. So again, getting away from this idea that it's really a government-centric approach that works and recognizing that there's a lot that we can't do or that we're not the experts in doing. And so figuring out how to leverage those resources um, as part of our jobs. Thank you, Rich. Um, so I want to have a particular question for uh, Wendy. Um, <laughs> we talked about, earlier we talked about um, kind of how, expect and I had those numbers up there, how expectations are changing, and it kind of goes into the, the piece of the whole community, how expectations are changing from the standpoint of, of what the public expects their kind of response organizations to be engaging with, mm -hmm. right? You know, are you going to be there on a Facebook page to respond to my comments? Are you going to be actively engaged on Twitter? Um, the Red Cross um, over the past two years has issued a, a survey um, to kind of gauge public use of these tools and then also what are their expectations with respect to emergency management and disaster response. Um, could you tell us, speak to us a little bit more about what you guys have found, what are some of the trends, and then how the Red Cross is kind of one of the, you know, institutions when we talk about kind of the nonprofit perspective of emergency response, um, how you guys have adapted to those expectations. Sure. So the survey that we did, uh, we did one in August of 2010, and then we did a follow-up in August of 2011. And the the trends are are similar. They just got a little bit uh, more pronounced in the in the year between 2010 and 2011. So basically, the the biggest shouter from uh, from the results of that uh, of both of those surveys for me is that the public has an incredible and what I think is probably uh, an unrealistic expectation of what uh, em emergency managers are capable of doing today as far as even listening, let alone acting on the information that they're telling them. And they, um, you know, three out of four people expect that if they write on the wall of, you know, for example, uh, the DC Fire EMS Facebook page, that they need help, that they expect that help to arrive within an hour. Not that someone will respond to them on Facebook within an hour, but that the actual help will be there and on its way. And so that's, you know, almost as fast as dominoes, <laughs> and we don't really work that way. Uh, so I, I think it, it's just a, an eye-opener in that the public is sort of moving faster than us, and Brian Humphreys has said we can't afford to move at the speed of government anymore, right? Uh, and, and I think part of the uh, the whole community and the way that we're trying to adjust is to really allow the public to become part of a, a, a resource um, instead of sort of thinking of them as a liability or just stay out of the way or just stay, you know, don't worry about it. Now they can really become a participant in how emergency management works. Um, and so for us, we're just making a commitment to to listen, I think, on that scale of the four things that you had there, you know, we've been doing that that listening very robustly for about four years now. Uh, it's getting harder and harder because there's more and more data every day. Um, and for that, we're piloting, you know, the digital volunteer system so that people can um, help us to scale up to make sure that we're getting important uh, information during, especially during times of disaster. We've gotten pretty good. There's always room for improvement on that real, the one-way messaging out. So we, we try to report every single thing that we know about our response to any given situation to our newsroom, to Twitter, to, to our blogs, and we just try to make as much of that public as we possibly, I put everything I can get my grubby little fingers on and make it public. So. Um, and then the, the two-way conversation is, is sort of where we're at now, where we're really trying to figure out how the public might, how we might filter all of this data and turn it into something meaningful. And, and I think we're making great strides there, but there, you know, certainly we've all brought up that there are issues there. And then, you know, the next stop is really allowing the, the public to have, uh, to be a leader, you know, to be, to, to be giving directives and to have a, a real, 
clear sense of what their role is and what it is that's valuable for them to do and to participate in whenever a disaster happens. Um, I want to turn this question of, and one of the recommendations was to possibly do some type of national survey to establish kind of a baseline on, on where we at as a nation with respect to technology and um, disaster response, emergency management. Um, I'm really happy to have Pascal here. Um, he spent, what was it, September uh, on the road in uh, what was called a crisis camper. Um, and he was all up and down the West Coast over in Texas, through Oklahoma, I believe, um, and stopped and talked with kind of emergency managers, different organizations along the way about what are they seeing with respect to these tools so far, how are they using them. Um, I guess, Pesco, could you just tell us a little bit more about that experience? What are you seeing out there um, with respect to kind of, A, a willingness to engage with these tools um, in these particular organizations, and then are the capabilities even there um, if someone wanted to? Great, thank you. Yeah, first of all, just everybody knows the Crisis Camper was a, a project for Crisis Commons. It, it was about 4,500 miles in 15 and a half days in uh, a 30 foot RV camper. <laughs> um, we got in a hotel room twice. This, uh, Jeff uh, Phillips in Los Ranchos, New Mexico, has provided us a hotel room halfway through the trip, it was really nice. Um, <laughs> But we did, we did get the drive through. I've never driven through Texas across east, west to east, and I have now successfully done that. But the camper was a great opportunity because we stopped in over 16 cities, major areas, and we were able to actually communicate. Um, I had two great colleagues with me. One of them was Alex Rose from the Los Angeles area, and Jacob Greer was a programmer from Portland. And so we had um, – Alex took time off from his work as well. He works for the Red Cross in the L.A. region, and I took time off of my job. And then Jacob Greer is a programmer who could just take off whenever he wants. And uh, we all admired that process. <laughs> but the ability for us to get together and go to cities instead of all the cities trying to send someone to a conference, we were able to really connect with the communities because they brought from smaller communities and their communities together. Our average stop was normally about 25 people. We're in a room and we just had a discussion. We presented some things about open data, open technologies, uh, the virtual support teams, and just the tools. And then we had a discussion. We had the ability to ask questions about how could they use it, what policy issues are they fighting and are there challenges with. What was really noticeable is everyone's dealing with the same issues, the slowness of government. Um, I give credit to the city of Houston. They're very forward moving, um, as well as some of the other great cities. But the challenge that we noticed for me personally was we need to do this together. This is a capability. It really brought attention to how social media is a global issue or a global community as you know craig's or administrator for you gates uh, i call him craig i, <laughs> no, no, I saw no. i he saw would be angry if he knew that i was sitting here calling him administrator for you i think he'd like us all to call him craig. you know I, we, we talked to him at the camper at, at the nema conference in austin and we were having a good discussion about the globe is getting smaller because of the social technology and process you know crisis commons assists globally through crisis response do we need to do this all individually? And we, we really brought that attention out during the camper tour is, no, we don't. We should be able to do these together and be able to effectively use our dollar value in a much greater reach than ever before because tools can be created across the board for everyone to use, in the United, at least in the United States for sure, because of the ICS, the Incident Command System, the National Incident Management System for us to, to follow. And if we can do that, we can save cities thousands and millions of dollars of time and money but also in mitigation cost, in recovery cost, in long-term issues faced upon their economy of, of following disasters or catastrophic events. So that was the biggest thing that we saw. The second one that we saw is people are thriving for this change. Um, in emergency management, there's a huge community there that are getting ready to retire. You know, I think that problem exists in government everywhere. But for me, I focus in emergency management, and that is happening very quickly. How do we grab that institutional knowledge? How do we use the future tools? so we can change the process of government at the same time to look at these new tools rather than keeping the traditional things um, afloat. Not saying tradition is good to get rid of, but we do need to change part of that tradition and that capability. So those are the two major things, um, other than the food was phenomenal. Kind of kind of with respect to that issue um, and, and how do we begin to kind of operationalize uh, some, some of these things and bring those and, and, and begin to add value to to what these emergency managers are doing and, and like you said, help them out, relieve, you know, s save cities millions of dollars. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to, uh, I invited Karen here today is she is, um, 
she's done a lot of work, I think, um, some with respect to humanitarian logistics and international response, but we had a conversation a while ago about, you know, again, we talked about those uh, 345,000 pieces of data, right? And one of the things that she's been looking at and working on is, is how can we use this real-time data um, to inform the decision makers when it comes to things like transportation and, and, and routing, right? If we have this kind of information about, you know, five bridges are down or are in an area, how, do, how does that change our logistics and routing plan, um, you know, real time? Karen, could you talk a little bit more about some of the work that you've done and kind of where you hope um, that this can go uh, moving forward? Sure, sure. I, I like the example when, that Wendy said about Domino's Pizza. Um, because in my own field of operations research, what we do is route vehicles, um, look at mathematical models to improve your decision making. So how does UPS get your packages to you faster or Domino's get your pizza faster? And so a natural question is, well, can we leverage what we know from the commercial side to the emergency response side? And there have always been differences. There are reasons why we can't. Um, but one of the, or two of the main reasons that people say the models need to be different is lack of technology and lack of data. And I think what, you know, what you've seen um, over recent years is that really is changing. And so how, how do we adjust the way we do our models so that we can make logistics more efficient on the response side? I don't think it's going to evolve to where UPS is because it's just different. You know, everything you've heard about today, all of those tweets, that's different data than UPS has. Um, the, the nature, the conditions of the transportation infrastructure are very different in these settings. And so what we're looking at is how do you integrate data from all these different sources? Um, you know, sometimes people will post data that can easily be incorporated into GIS. Uh, Ushahidi is a great resource in that respect. But then others will post a PDF of a map. And so how do you uh, integrate that into your models? So what we've been looking at is, you know, getting to your question of sifting through all the data. You know, what I want to know is what are the conditions of the arcs in your network, or the roads, if you will, <laughs> if you want to call them that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, how do we sift through that quickly so that we can make better decisions? How do we dynamically adjust our routes? How do we get to maybe some rules of thumb so that you don't necessarily need the GPS in your vehicle and so that you can make better decisions um, on the fly, making use of all that information? So I think it's a very challenging um, from a, a modeling perspective to integrate all this data. I think the other point that Wendy made about the expectations also changes the way we do the models. You know, one of the reasons why modeling is different is your objective function is different. You know, if you just use profit maximizing or minimizing costs, which we'll do on the commercial side, I'm going to go to, you know, the people who need help who are really close to where I am and forget about everybody else. But I don't think anyone in this room would be very happy with that model. So how does that change the underlying model? And I think it's a, a very rich field for academia, but the important thing is to have, you know, I thank Clarence for inviting me today because you need to have this two-way dialogue to say, are we modeling the right things? You know, for me, just finding out what data is out there. This, you know, the past couple of years has just been an explosion of learning for, of all of the data that's out there. You know, we just didn't know five years ago what we could use, and that's been really interesting. Well, thank you. Um, I guess Kim, I, I have a question for you on kind of training and education, and I know you've kind of done some trainings and built educational models before. Um, and kind of the SMEM camp was almost like a proof of concept, so to speak. It was the first time that I think you guys had done this. Um, and I think we received a lot of good feedback about that model. Um, there were certainly some, some areas we can improve in. What would you, what have you seen so far with, with respect to kind of tra training and education uh, with respect to these tools? Are, are folks out there open to learning more? What are the challenges in uh, kind of conveying that information and kind of the excitement that you have? Well, I, I think the problem with training is we really aren't quite sure what a best practice looks like. We know intuitively what an organization does is, or is doing a good job. Like Pascal said, Houston's doing a good job. But in the end, do we know if what they're doing is changing behavior? Is it saving lives? Those kinds of things. Um, I think until we have really good handle on core best practices and decide as a community what those best practices are, which your paper also gets to, um, then we can start to develop more trainings that are more specific. Right now, we're getting to well, you need to tweet this often, and what's, a twi you know, what's Twitter and what's Facebook, and kind of the, the basics. 
So I, I know that EMI is developing some training currently, and even they are searching for best practices and trying to get the community to, to give them examples of, of what is a good social media campaign. But I don't know that we're quite there yet. So training basically now is anecdotal evidence of what has happened and, and why that's a good practice and why subjectively we think that, that people should be doing, um, you should be using these tools. So I, I'm kind of, I guess, questioning um, how we do move forward with that without having really a core curriculum set or even an understanding of target capabilities in this area. And, and I guess I'm just kind of punting on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an interesting question. Fair enough, question. fair enough. Uh, place for sure. Yeah, this brings up the fact that what you're dealing with here is the moving target. Exactly. Uh, Social, uh, social behavior. I'm Rebecca Goolsby from the Office of Naval Research. Um, and social behavior is changing. Uh, the way we tweet is changing. Some practices are, they're trying to, you know, like, tweet the, to track the, uh, tweet the, track the tweet, tweet the track. <laughs> um, they uh, are trying to be moved in. Some are moving around. So what, uh, so I'm very interested in Dr. Smilowitz in the, in the integration of social science into this. Brian Sola said that social media is 90% sociology and 10% technology. And my data mining people get a little upset and ask me to please quote that as 80% or <laughs> even more. Um, so uh, what, are, what is the, the kind of engagement? Who's doing the best work in social science, in sifting, in understanding social behavior? Who's out there? Who's the best? At Northwestern, I think. <laughs> of course. Of course. Uh, no, we do have a group. Um, but there are, there are I, not necessarily my research, but there are groups um, who are looking at the dynamics of the, the complex systems because I think that is important. I think that's when you think about the underlying assumptions of our models from, like, from a routing perspective, what you said about the social dynamics, the demand moves. And social media moves them. You know, people aren't dumb. If there's no supplies here, I'm not going to stay. I'm going to move to where they got supplies, where they got the, the relief aid. And so that, you, you can't do the routing models without the social, um, social science because you can't model recipients as just end demand. In Domino's Pizza, you can you know, I'm going to get my pizza. I'm not going to change where I live, so I'm closer to Domino's. Um, but in these models, you do need to consider that. So I think that that's really important. And I think that there's been a big push within humanitarian logistics to bring together the social scientists and the engineers to make sure that what we're, that, that we're speaking to each other and making sure that the models really represent what's happening in the, on the field. Uh Social behavior changes to flow with the new apps. You just have to look at Shelly. That's why I think it's really important not to teach the tools, not to have a class on how to post on Facebook and how to use Twitter, but to teach to objectives and goal setting. What are, you, what are your goals as an organization? If your goal as an organization is to reach your community in a rapid way, then, then how do you do that? And so you really, before you start any sort of social media platform and presence, you have to think about what the goal is for your organization to engage on those platforms. And I think that's a broader discussion than a class on how to use Twitter. It, so it, for me, I look at it this way. I try and tell the people this process. Do I need to teach you how to use Word, or do I need to teach you how to, use, how to write in Word? Right. So it's just like the same thing. Do I need to teach you how to use a telephone, or do I need to teach you how to use the phone to get your point across? It's not about the tool. It's about what message we get across. So I explain that in saying, Social media is no different than me using my phone, me going to stand on a soapbox in the corner with a bullhorn, or using an email. It's the exact same thing, just in a different way. And that's why it's just the same things, the same problems we've had of all the other technologies, we can use the same type of training me methods. And uh, kind of kind of on that, on that point, I'm glad you brought that up, Rebecca. One of the things that's been kind of interesting to me, and I want to get Re uh, Rachel's opinion on this, and she, then she, she has to go, um, is it is really a new kind of medium in that that behavioral aspect is really important, especially we've seen, you know, great research in emergency management disaster response on, on how, uh, you know, what my neighbor does affects what I'm going to do, right? So we've seen an evacuation behavior. If everyone in my community is evacuating, I'm a lot more likely to evacuate, right? From a preparedness perspective, if, if everybody around me is getting a, you know, a, a readiness or a preparedness kit, you know, I'm a lot more likely to take that serious. And I think 
what we kind of have the opportunity to do from a messaging standpoint um, in particular is it's not, you know, just Administrator Fugate is coming on TV now and saying, you know, Hurricane Irene is coming, go get your, uh, you know, your, your water and your Doritos or whatever, but I can now see real time uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, you know, my friends are at, you know, Target stocking up on, on foodstuffs. And so I think there's, for, from my perspective, I think that's kind of a unique opportunity, and I'd be curious, um, in particular, Rachel being here the day after the first ever national <laughs> test of the emergency alert system, um, <laughs> what type of, uh, how, how is FEMA thinking about um, these things from a messaging standpoint, and how do we leverage kind of, you know, how can I, how can you reach out and get my mother to tell me to go get my preparedness kit as, a, as opposed to, you know, President Obama or Administrator Fugate? That's right. Well, first of all, I don't know who sort of experienced the emergency alert system test and who didn't. I know it was, uh, some folks saw it, some people didn't. Um, and that was actually, it's a really interesting sort of, um, I guess, foray in all the different things we're talking about here today because we are actually, as some of you probably know from following Craig or other folks in our own on Twitter, we're actually soliciting feedback on Twitter about um, what people experience. So you can absolutely tweet Craig at, at Craig at FEMA or you can... Um, He's yeah, tweeting he's now. tweeting now, so there you go. <laughs> Sorry, my uh, he is tweeting now. I'm not checking my BlackBerry as, uh, as I'm doing this. But, um, but anyway, so definitely we would be curious to get your feedback. Um, I think there's just so many interesting um, aspects that, you know, you've raised and others have raised about sort of the behavioral piece of this and how that will impact um, the way that people are thinking about this stuff differently. I mean, you were talking during your presentation, Clarence, about sort of, you know, trust, right? And we know, obviously, that the government is not always the most trusted entity in terms of, you know, what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. People sort of tend to think that, you know, either the government is maybe overreacting to something, whether it's, you know, Mayor Bloomberg yelling at, you know, the hipsters in Brooklyn to get out of the way because of Hurricane Irene coming, or the news media overreacting about a storm. And so I do think that to some extent when you're seeing, you know, your peers doing things, whether it's, you know, seeing what they're doing on Twitter or they're commenting on Facebook and saying, yeah, we're actually taking this one seriously, it does have a little bit of a different impact and effect on what you will do as opposed to just, you know, hearing Craig Fugate saying what he's saying on TV, which he is saying because he wants the public to take things seriously, but also we do have a responsibility as uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency to obviously get messages out that way. So I do think that the trust factor there is just, it's just sort of an interesting element that actually allows people to, to sort of look to their more trusted I hate to say messengers because that's a very sort of like PR term, but to look to their more trusted messengers, whether it's their neighbors, their family members, whoever it is in their community that they sort of trust, as opposed to just hearing what federal officials or state officials and local officials are saying. Um, I think another just sort of interesting point in all of this is that in some ways, and, and I do look at this a little bit more maybe through the lens of what sometimes reporters say to me about social media and how we're using it, which is not to say that a lot of reporters don't understand sort of the two-way communication value. Um, but I think a lot of people in the news media see, you know, Craig's use of Twitter, and obviously he's one of the more sort of progressive folks um, at the federal agency level in terms of thinking about how to use it and what its use can be. Um, and they say, oh, that's really great that, Qu you know, Craig's tweeting, or you guys are using Facebook. Like, wow, you're really getting it. And they're, they're thinking about it in the sort of like, five years ago sense of, oh, we're just using these as like another PR strategy to get messages out. And Craig's always the first person to say, that's not what we're using it for at all. Like, I'm not doing this because I'm trying to make myself look good or, you know, it's, we're trying to get out press releases. This is really about having this two-way communications channel and knowing if we're not getting commodities somewhere or people somewhere need help and we're not getting it to them, we need to know. Um, and so I think it's, it's definitely sort of the situational awareness aspect and really, being able to sort of crowdsource and see, okay, in Virginia, where people are being told to evacuate, are traffic routes bad? Can we get that information out to, you know, sort of state officials who we maybe are monitoring this too, but how can we sort of help coordinate and just connect people where they need to be connecting to get information? Um, and then the second piece is really customer service. Um, and again, those of you who interact with Craig on Twitter probably know this, but I mean, if you tweeted him and say, you guys sent me a letter, this is more on sort of the recovery side, but you sent me a letter about my individual assistance that FEMA gave me that doesn't make any sense. It's written in legalese, I don't understand it, it's really insensitive. That will help us fix that problem and be better, sort of, you know, provide better customer service. So it's really, it's, it's much more about, um, I mean, not just the information we put out, but really the information that we take in. And a good example of this actually, and sort of how we saw something and then sort of use that to make changes in our decision-making process was during Hurricane Irene and our um, 
our, we've got obviously sort of our main FEMA Twitter feed, but we do also have regional uh, Twitter handles um, that help us sort of get a better sense of what's happening locally around the country and, and target information better. Um, and I can't remember if it was in Virginia or Pennsylvania. I want to say it was in Pennsylvania, but we noticed through Twitter that a lot of folks weren't evacuating because they didn't know where to take their pets. They didn't know of shelters that would take pets. And as a lot of you guys know, whether or not you can bring your pet with you is actually going to have a huge impact on what you'll do during a disaster. Um, and so we were able to use that information and to really see, it's not like we were just seeing that from, you know, one person or two people, but it was really a problem that was growing, and Twitter is what helped us identify it, um, to then, you know, work with um, the state and county officials to make sure that we were getting information out to, to them about where they could take their pets. And that helped us, you know, it's a very simple thing, but that helped us solve a problem, get better situational awareness on sort of where folks were, weren't evacuating, um, and just, you know, help do our jobs, which is actually to, as you guys know, support state and local officials. FEMA isn't, you know, we're not the folks who actually open or run shelters, as the Red Cross knows, but we want to obviously make sure we're almost traffic cops, getting people to the right place, so. Uh, well, thank you, Rachel. Um, I know you got to go. Yeah, well, I'm thank sorry, you for, guys. Uh, I would actually love to stay and continue this. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, sure, real quick. Uh, I want to raise the issue of, of the public affairs side. Mm -hmm. I come from this background, having worked on the state department. Uh, <laughs> counter uh, task forces during counterterrorism incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, get reliability. The problems in for the incident managers and public affairs people to filter out reliable mm -hmm. information yep. and then feed it back. Um, and it's, this may happen in natural disasters, but in terrorist incidents, there's a danger yep. of the bad guys putting yep. injecting yep. False information. False information. Yep. Um, can any of you comment on, on to what extent you're addressing the issue of how to verify the information quickly and also important I f at least I found getting the crisis managers to respond to press guidance and quickly to, to get things out to the public and, and press because the last thing you want to say is no comment etc right. uh, one approach I, I heard in a social media discussion at Harvard recently was El Jira had actually trained people in advance not to be full journalists but somebody they could count on reliably uh, to report, and I wonder if any thought has been given with within the government or Red Cross to try to train people at the local level, whether dedicated police officers or Red Cross officials, for that kind of reporting stream to check out the reliability. So at least the people who have to draft the press guides, mm -hmm. you know, have some assurances of, of reliability. Well, so let's say Pascal wants to jump in. I'll let him go. I would say something. A couple things. One, give us more money to have hire more analysts if you want to find out the counterterrorism part, because here's the problem. It's going to happen no matter what. So what I look at it is, is it's situational awareness. I grab all that information and I bring it in so that it can then be analyzed. And we have tools and capabilities to analyze that information. If I need more people to do that, then I should be able to call more people to do that. The question is, is do I need to have that happen in my local EOC, or can that happen somewhere else? What's nice about social media and the, the technology is, I don't have to be in the disaster area to analyze that information. So instead of me having to hire more people to analyze information, why don't I have the people in Denver, Chicago, New York, DC, LA, Orlando, and Atlanta help me analyze the information that's happening in a catastrophic event in the Seattle area. So, so that, that's intelligence we can use now, but I'm, when you're talking counterterrorism and counterintelligence, uh, there's experts mm -hmm. all over the United States and all over the world that do that. They don't need to be here. For local situation awareness, same thing. I don't have to create a call center to answer my phones for recovery hotline when I know I can call Denver up and say, could you guys activate your EOC and hire, get your staff in there on an eight hour shift, not worrying about disaster, not worried about the weather, whatever it is, to help fulfill the role. So I don't have to increase that expenditure cost. I can use what's already been paid for by Homeland Security funds and other funds to help do what I need to do because of this tool's capability to being global already. If Crisis Commons were able, was able to help Christchurch, Japan, Haiti, and many other areas in Joplin and Alabama without ever leaving my house and other, everyone's homes from a global response perspective, why do we always have to create it locally when we can work virtually globally together? And as we're saying here at FEMA, that's the whole community. That's the responses community. Let's use that capability to provide it. What we need help with right now, what I see is let's get that situational awareness together. 
let's get the tools to filter the 5,500 tweets per second because I don't know of any 911 center or any intelligence center that can handle that many tweets at that many times, that much in time for a period of time for probably 40, 50 hours following a major catastrophic event. So it's a different change perspective on that. We got a good question down front here for a while. Um, first of all, I'm going to play off of your comment that we have unexpected uh, uh, our expectations, the public's expectations in government uh, has been too high. And I would just put out uh, a possible assumption that perhaps they've been enculturated into relying on hierarchical systems because there hasn't been something else, but now there is something else. And Pascal, in his last comments, sort of talk about how we can create a swarm capability. Um, there is a symposium on social media and governance in times of transition next week. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think about the possibility that it's not just about government becoming acquainted with the tools and learning how to utilize the tools more effectively, but in fact, the nature of governance is changing. That we have fundamentally different systems now. The public isn't going to wait for government. They're going to build their own swarms. And we're seeing this in Occupy Everywhere all over the world right now. And I don't have evidence that the government really has a clear vision of what governance means under these circumstances. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. Go ahead. Well, I, I am not a government employee, but I'm a, a nonprofit employee. And I think the, the idea that we're really looking at is, you know, we've been for 130 years a very fortressed institution with high walls around ourselves. And I, you know, what we have to do is tear down those walls and make the, there be almost no difference between surge communities, ad hoc communities, and and people who actually work for the Red Cross. Um, from my observations, a, a good example is a tornado went through a town, and a 16-year-old started a Facebook page just in her basement, literally while she was sheltering. Within three days, had 500 people in the community out of 8,000 on the page. Within a couple of weeks, 2,000 out of 8,000 are on the page. So I'm talking to the emergency manager. Oh, I don't, I don't do social media. So he wasn't even really aware of what was happening on, on the page. And I think what is, what, the importance of it, though, is meeting need with the desire to help. And what we often don't talk about, and what, what we really didn't talk about at the camp, is in the recovery phase, you really have a huge presence on social media of people who want to help and people who want to facilitate that help getting to those who need it the most. Donations and volunteer management is part of our plan that we really don't exercise very often. We always exercise law enforcement and fire. We exercise those parts of the response 24 hours. The recovery phase is very difficult to exercise. So a lot of communities are surprised when donations start showing up within three hours of an event happening. How can you leverage those social tools to intercept those donations and make sure they go to the right place? And I think that the whole community concept is really actually brilliant, brilliantly employed in this, in this space. You have a community of already existing organizations who can be together on a platform in a collaborative nature before the event to help facilitate donations. For example, if I want to know where I want to donate, where can I um, provide a donation for Christmas or Thanksgiving in my community, if I go to that one page, I could find those organizations and make my donation. If that platform existed after a crisis, I would know to go to that platform so I could have a donation. I think somebody had a, had a comment. Rebuild Joplin is my favorite example of this. So, um, I, I had a kind of a question about how we integrate the tools into like responsiveness. Um, I'm Alex from uh, Department of Homeland Security, one of our many offices, um, who's looking at uh, social media and its use in emergency response. And so the question that I kind of had was, um, let's say, for example, that there is uh, an emergency situation, you know, some sort of disaster that's small, it's incident focused. Um, but you have an enormous amount of traffic that starts coming over the network, right? People start, you know, tweeting, they start sending photos, they start uploading those things onto Facebook or any other social media platforms. But 
the emergency response center is just generally unaware within a short period of time that there is an emergency happening in that space, right? So the example uh, that we heard on another panel was when um, uh, the, uh, the, I think it was the Delta flight uh, that crashed into the Hudson River happened. Somebody uploaded a photo to Twitter faster than anybody had called the 911 center. Um, I had friends of mine who were tweeting about the earthquake in New York City almost even before I felt it in Washington, D.C., right, the Virginia earthquake. So the question is, um, what kind of uh, responsive measures are being undertaken, and Pascal, you can probably talk about this, um, are on the emergency response level locally to kind of cogn cognizantly understand um, the traffic uh, and provide response, and without things like people innately understanding a unique hashtag, without setting that up ahead of time, how do we understand that data and, and you know, actionably recognize it? So, personally, I don't think there's anyone actually live monitoring social media in that kind of sense yet. It, it, well, there's some, there's security. Some, in 911 emergency, management, yeah, security, technology, cyber, yeah. terrorism, all that stuff they are, but when you, when you look at it in the sense of a 911 operation center, I don't believe that because they're, they're kind of waiting for the next gen to be defined. But I look at that as the opportunity for us to change that mentality. But at the same time, I look at something that's different. And when I was talking about sharing our resources, how many FEMA region offices do we have? And do they cover every state and every territory in the United States? Do they have a 24-hour RRCC response center? Yes, it's manned. Why can't we use existing structures to help alter and modify to these new technologies and go to, go to Craig and say, Craig, let's build situational awareness for social media tools inside all the RCCCs, but allow local agencies, so allow King County, allow Seattle, allow the state to sit inside the RRCC and unify together. We have those kind of in some areas, but they're called fusion centers. But they're doing something different than what we're trying to do. And I don't think they're able to adapt to that because they're focused on a very sensitive area, which is great, but it's the daily process. It's a small chemical truck that spills over and leaks pneumonia, and we need to evacuate an area. Fusion centers just, is a, the, a terrorist cut them off and do it purposely, or, okay, no, it's not, so it's just a normal event. I think we, we're able to create that capability, which allows us to have that regional opportunity. We're not really spending that much more money. We have the capability already there. We're just adding, like I said earlier, another phone line, but that phone line happens to be a small little device that you can tweet back and forth with. That's a newer capability that we need to try and break down and change to, and I think that will help that process. In the interim, that's the importance of being on the platforms, because if something happens in your community and you're already a presence on that platform, someone will send you a message. I think that's the interim answer, and that happens a lot. If, if you're very active and tweeting a lot, people will send you an at message so that it comes to your attention if you're not noticing it yourself. So, and then you can also ask the community like Andy Carvin does of NPR to then send you messages. During the uh, tsunami after the earthquake in Japan, he was getting conflicting information about when it was supposed to hit Hawaii. So does anybody have an exact time of when the tsunami is supposed to hit Hawaii? And I just use this example because I happened to be on Twitter at the time and I found the NOAA site and sent him a direct link to credible information and then he re retweeted it to 30,000 people. So oh. it's, it's a matter of being in that space. If you're not in the space at all and you don't have 20,000 followers to ask a question, then you're not going to get an answer. Yeah. Um, Some good work out of MIT um, looking at the 4636 data from Haiti. So even when there was a hashtag, and I can give you the contact afterwards, uh, even when you have a hashtag and you have everyone um, sending information to the same place, what are the challenges of categorizing and what are some of the, the problems that can happen? There's specific data that people are looking at or looking for, but you can only get that if, the, if it's categorized in the right way. And so that if it's translated, you know, there were a lot of translation issues there too. So even when you have, have the hashtag, as I said, there's still so many issues of getting the data in the right form. It's complicated. <laughs> um, so I think we are nearing the 10 o'clock hour. Um, I'm sorry. One more yeah, so we'll, have, we'll take one more question if anyone has a, a burning question um, and then kind of wrap up. Um, any more questions? Just getting started. Yeah, we're just getting warmed up. <laughs> My flight's not until tomorrow afternoon. I'm, I can go all night. <laughs>
if there's no question, can I make a comment about the, the communication of the EAS test from yesterday? Sure. I, I wanna, one thing I talk about a lot is about the spectrum of communication, and I think I've mentioned a little bit more of, you know, we use phones, we use um, telephone. You know, I was here yesterday, I was meeting with Leah, and we we're walking out of the, one of the rooms, and um, Justin was with me too, where, and it was, it was two o'clock. And the way I heard about the EAS test was through my Twitter account. And I look at that and I go, we, we need to really make sure we remind people of the importance of not just the EAS test nationally is we need to work about the social media. But look how long it took for us to get a national EAS test compared to look how long ago we've already had a national social media capability. Because Craig at Fugate can send a message out. FEMA can send a message out. Wendy Harmon at Red Cross can send a message out. We have multiple people that can send a message out and can get to millions of people fairly quickly. Yet yesterday in an EAS test, which I'm very happy it went, it didn't really work too well in Oregon and Washington as a couple stations, but people were notified. But I'm an emergency manager, and I was never notified. I should have been notified in an alternative source, even if I was traveling, because that capability is there. And I think that's part of the generational change that we have that's coming with technology. We have to adapt much faster, and we have to look at it. I'm not saying let's get rid of EAS. It's a very functional tool. I'm not saying let's get rid of reverse 911 capabilities, but let's enhance it, making sure that we cover all the spectrums. Because my question to you guys today is, how many high school students, how many college students, Generation Y and Generation Z, did not get that emergency alert system test? And so what is that percentage of our population that we think are going to get the message who are not? And compare that to the people who are following social media in that age category of the politics that are going on between the Republicans, the Democrats for a presidential election. Are we off kilter? And how do we alert that process and how do we change that? That's, I think, somewhere where we need to push the policy process to change things. Thank you, Pesco. I think those are good words to wrap up on. Um, I'd like to thank the panel um, for coming out. Um, I think there's a lot of knowledge up here. If you guys want to stick around and kind of pick their brains for a little bit, I encourage you to do that. Um, and I think kind of one of the things that we've seen today and uh, one of the reasons I kind of wanted kind of a diverse panel is that there's, there's a lot of different actors and a lot of different issues that are all interrelated. And only when we can get, you know, government, academia, nonprofit sector, private sector on the same page in one room talking about these issues can we start to move these things forward. Um, so I just encourage the conversation to move forward. Um, out of here. I think we've raised uh, a lot of issues today, and uh, hopefully uh, folks out there will see something here that they think that they should, uh, is worth working on. Um, the report will be posted on, I think, both the Woodrow Wilson site, the uh, CNA website, and um, tomorrow there will be several bloggers from uh, within the social media and emergency management community um, kind of talking about some of these issues. And so um, Kim Stevens, uh, on her blog, she'll actually have a list of, of, of folks um, who, who you guys should all check out. So again, I wanted to thank everyone for coming out. Um, still lots of work to do. And um, I think Leah may have a few Yeah, words. we also would like to thank you. We also would like to thank CNA and the hard work of Clarence Wardell and Crisis Commons for helping to organize this event. The report will be posted on both CNA, Crisis Commons, and Wilson Center websites, and the archived webcast of this event should be posted by sometime next week. Uh, we'll try to provide links to all the blog posts that get set up, and uh, we may even have some folks interview some of the panelists for more uh, deep dive discussion. We have another event planned, tentatively planned, for third week of January on social media for international disaster management. So stay tuned. Go to the Wilson Center uh, webpage, wilsoncenter.org, uh, for the events list. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks.